So this is a talk about modal synthesis using Synthemodeler. Um, Synthemodeler is software for doing physical modeling, sound synthesis, which is a technique where you use the physics, you simulate physics. Oh, I'm running through. Um, here we go. Uh -huh. Um, so, so if you use a computer to simulate the physics of a system, you can, in real time, you can use the physical variables to synthesize sound, and and that's an interesting approach you can use for making music because um, it's just an, another. You can have a lot of different controls for controlling the sound, and you can explore different ways of doing that and create new timbres that you might not discover otherwise. And so it's kind of an interesting thing to learn a little bit about. And so that's why um, we had suggested having this talk. So um, Pascal Kopp and Zach Berkowitz have both worked on this. And um, some of the text is in German, and I apologize. I guess I'll just read it in, in English, though. So um, an introduction to modal synthesis. Um, what is that? It's when you... Um, take something that's vibrating and, and, and model its resonance frequency characteristics using a computer. So basically there are a bunch of frequencies that are decaying and for each frequency you have you know, what the frequency is in hertz, so how many times it oscillates per second. You have a decay time, which is a, measured in seconds, which describes how fast something is decaying. So if it has a long decay time, then it takes a long time for the sound to decay. If it takes a short, if the decay time is very short, then the sound decays very fast. And it's also important to have an amplitude. And so you can take um, any sort of, uh, sort of impulsive sounding sound and decompose it into um, frequencies with decay times and amplitudes. And um, in this case, so the, if you're doing this use in Synthemodeler using the um, resonators object, uh, the, it makes a certain assumption, which is that basically um, the, the system that you're modeling starts from a, a zero displacement. So it starts with an initial velocity, but the initial displacement is zero. So that means the sound is described as a summation of... Uh, exponential decaying sinusoids. If you have a different um, boundary conditions, then you would also have some decaying cosine terms here. But in this case, these are eliminated um, for a somewhat complex reason. But basically, you can you can guarantee something about the phase of this system, which means that in Synthemodeler, then when you connect all these different objects together, it will be stable. Whereas if you don't meet the phase requirement, then uh, you might violate the Nyquist stability condition and then it goes unstable. So that's something you want to avoid. So that's why these models are limited in this way. Um, here are some more pictures of this actually. And so often if you're studying mechanics or Newtonian physics, you would think about what is a, an exponentially decaying sine wave? What is the corresponding mechanical model for that? Well, it's a mass connected through a spring to ground, and there's also a damper connecting the mass to ground. So you can kind of imagine sort of setting that mass in motion and it moves up and down for a while and it stops. And if there's just a little bit of damping, then the decay time is very long. If there's a lot of damping, then the decay time is very short. And in Synthemodeler, we incorporate all the friction into the links themselves. So in Synthemodeler, this is just a mass connected by a linear link to ground. Um, are there any questions about the, the basis of modal synthesis? Yes. Oh, I guess so. I guess so, yes. Now. Yes. Okay. I was wondering, there was written psychoacoustic, or psychoacoustic maybe on one of the slides, or maybe I was mistaken. Yeah. Uh, so are you going to explain the psycho component, or do we stick to the, to the physical stuff? 
Um, well, part of, part of the psychoacoustic part, I guess, is is you know this assumption here that you can have a finite number of exponentially decaying sine waves to approximate certain sounds. Other sounds can't be approximated mm -hmm. using. Well, I mean, if you imagine some sine waves that are growing in amplitude, how could you represent yeah. that using exponentially decaying sine waves? Mm -hmm. It's 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 not a good idea anyway yeah. um, to try to do something like that. But um, yeah, certainly you 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 um, you only need a certain number of these, and maybe you could get rid of some of the quiet ones, and you wouldn't you wouldn't hear it. So if you're editing the synth modeler code and you see that some of the uh, exponentially decaying sinusoids have a very low amplitude, you could just take those out, mm -hmm. and it would sound very similar. And so that's I guess what I mean by psychoacoustic modeling in the field of audio. Uh, computing, we do a lot of psychoacoustic modeling and using it to reduce the amount of CPU, for example, that is required to do something. Um, and so that's um, that's that issue there. So uh, this the this particular work pertains to um, some of the one of the models really in particular in inside the synth modeler um, library which is if you have, uh, for certain systems, you can analytically solve for what the frequencies are, um, which is a really handy thing, actually. It's really great when you can just solve a differential equation <laughs> and you don't have to do it numerically. Um, and so people have done a lot of this and for, for geometries where that's true, um, you can just look up in a text what all the resonance frequencies are um, but you can't look up the decay time, so there's a question, or at least I don't know where you could look up the decay time. It's possible there's a paper or two written out there somewhere where someone has related the, the material parameters to the decay times for some certain systems, but I haven't seen it much. And this was actually something we experimented a lot with, because in a lot of sort of musical sounding sounds, the high frequencies decay faster than the low frequencies. That's true for a lot of drums, that's true for a lot of strings sort of percussion instruments in general. Um, and I can, I can sh at the end of the talk, I can show an example of something where this is not true and you'll hear that it sounds kind of funny. And so we, we asked ourselves, what would be a good way to incorporate this into the model itself? And um, what we did was we looked at a text, the text by uh, Rossing and Fletcher on musical acoustics. And in that book, there's a section on um, the decay of the partial frequencies in a vibrating string for, um, I believe it was a classical guitar, or in any case, it was some kind of acoustical guitar. And they related the different um, physical mechanisms that could cause the decay. And if you looked at that, you basically saw that you had something like this, where some of the T60s, at very low frequencies, some of the T60s, it would just be constant in frequency. So the decay times were all the same for the really low frequencies. And then suddenly there would be a cutoff frequency where some other behavior would become more important. And then, you know, there would be some other loss in the system that would cause the high frequencies to decay fast. So um, I think one of those sorts of things is actually the... Um, Let's see if I can remember. I think that there is some energy re radiated from a string directly into the air, actually. Not through the body, but a small amount. And because of the, the dipole characteristic, that happens more at high frequencies. So basically, there's some frequency at which that becomes important. And then the decay times become shorter. And so um, in that text, there are actually two cutoff frequencies. But we found sort of just listening to our models that to first approximation, you know, it was this first one that really mattered a lot and the other ones didn't matter so much. And so that could also be described as a psychoacoustic approximation that's made in terms of this model. Um, you know, that we didn't model the next cutoff frequency where it gets even steeper because these frequencies all decay so fast it sounds kind of similar anyway. But I'm sure you could cook up some example where it's important to have the other cutoff frequencies. But you know, you've seen the models now. You've seen that if you have 30 sliders to be adjusting, 
uh, you'll just go crazy at some point. So we tried to limit um, what you could get in in that way. And so um, the rest of the talk is just describing the rectangular membrane model in Synthomodeler, which looks like this. So here's the resonator's object. And so that when you to create an object like this, you have to specify a bunch of resonance frequencies, decay times, and uh, equivalent masses for each of those decay times. And then once you've specified those, you can connect it to these other objects. So in this case, it's assumed that you're plucking a uh, modal synthesis resonator object in this way. And so that's why there's a plectrum link here that's connecting that to a port. Yes. Um, would you uh, care to explain more like, or at least the, I, right now, I don't know what the resonators, what is the, the, the physical equivalence of the, the resonator actually? Even. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I guess I would call it a, a, a driving point impedance is what I've seen it described in the, in the electrical engineering acoustics textbooks. Um, which basically is, is an impedance whose phase is bounded between um, plus and minus 90 degrees, if that makes any sense. It's, it's any, you could, this is any, any transfer function you could measure by um, exerting a force on a point and measuring the velocity of that point in response is a driving point impedance. So you can measure that on the bridge of a violin, for example, by exerting a force on the bridge of a violin and then measuring the velocity with which it moves. So that's, that's how you would estimate a driving point impedance. And you can measure that for all sorts of structural vibrations. So does it have like one parameter, which is the force uh, with which, um, I don't know, with, with which the, the string is pulled? Or did I completely get that wrong? Um, This would have a lot of parameters. So basically, that is described by all these parameters right here. The res resonators object. Yes. Yeah, right. yes. Okay. Did I answer your question? Oh, d just go on. <laughs> this is this is a this is a time domain um, equation, but you could use the Fourier transform to calculate what the frequency response of this is, for example. And that would then correspond to an impedance that you would measure on a violin bridge or um, a drum membrane. You could measure this on a drum membrane as well. Um, I guess I, I see your point, though, that this is, this is a big approximation, you know, assuming that you're modeling some vibrational system and you only have one input and one output is obviously a very... It's a gross simplification, but you can still do a lot with it, which is why it's it's set up this way um, in Synthomodeler. And so, if you if you look in the code for this, so those of you who've installed Synthomodeler, you'll see um, it's called modal membrane, a modal model rectangular membrane, I believe. And you'll see there's a line in the in the model code which says this. It just instantiates the resonator's object with um, rectangular membrane simple, which is a function defined later, and you specify how many modes you simulate in the x-axis and how many modes you simulate in the y-axis. So if you set it up this way, you get, um, you get it set up with 40 modes. So it'll model 40 resonance frequencies and 40 decay times if you do it this way. So this is, this is sort of the, the line in the model code that I really like to tell everyone about because it, it makes it really easy to increase the order of the model if you want a more accurate sound or to decrease it if you want to save some CPU. Because maybe you could use just a smaller number of, of modes to capture the sound that you want to have. Um, and then, and actually maybe what I should do is just show this file just so you can see it with your own eyes um, as we're stepping through it. Oops. 
So this is the, the MDL file that you can compile into whatever target is you want to have. And um, right, so basically what that's saying is that right here you can have, you can set how many, how many modes you want to have. And if you want to model two modes in the x-axis and two in the y, or one in the x and a hundred in the y, then you can, you can play around with it there and see see how it changes the sound. You do have to recompile the code after changing that though, because um, if you've attended a Faust session, you will have seen the signal flow diagrams that f get generated by Faust. If you change the number of modes, the, the diagram suddenly changes a lot in size. So, so that's, that's this part basically. And so the remaining slides just really explain a little bit more how to read these, these MDL files. So if you want to use it with the fire fader, uh, you should put two ports in the MDL file. One is, there's one for each of these, but if you had a device with eight ports, then you would need, you know, more ports there. And I see I did this again with, um, and then you, you have to have a, a pluck link. So then you need to define this connection here, which connects resin one with dev one. And so you get that by saying pluck, and then you have to tell it a stiffness and a damping parameter, and also um, the sort of width of the plectrum, and an offset, which is usually zero. And then you give it a name, and you just say what it connects. You connect the resin one to dev one, uh, which it has right here. And then right here, I just wrote above this um, what the... So this is a variable, and you can define this variable using Faust code. This is really convenient. So you can write interaction stiffness equals H slider. And then here's where you set the pluck stiffness. So if you've used Faust, you're very used to writing these. You know, When you define a slider, you give it an initial value, a minimum value, a maximum value, and a step size. And uh, the same thing is done for the, the damping in the plectrum. So that's like saying how stiff is the pick you're using to play this resonator. Is it really stiff or is it, is it really compliant? And how much damping does it have in it? And then you get to set the material parameters for the model, which is kind of fun. So you can set um, what the length is in the x-axis, what the length is in the y-axis, what the surface tension is in newtons, and then also what the area of mass density is. Um, and so I'll show those models later, but that's basically that affects the timbre of the sound. And then the final bit that you have to figure out in the code is how to actually calculate the resonance frequencies from these variables. So this equation uh, calculates the speed of waves in a rectangular membrane with a tension of T and an area of mass density of rho. And then you look up in your favorite acoustics textbook, or if you're hardcore, you calculate it. Um, it's a good exercise, actually. This is one of the very first ones that will be in the chapter on this. Um, you can calculate the resonance frequency for the, the mode. You have to give it a name, so you could say, you know, an index, the mth and nth node, a mode, pardon me, would be this, then. You could look up this equation. Um, which is half times the square root of t over rho times the square root of m squared over lx squared plus n squared over ly squared. And if you, if you, but you could look up the modal synthesis equations for, or the resonance frequency equations for other structures that have been solved analytically and, and put, replace them in this model and, and it would be nice. So uh, then, yes. Uh, is there any criterion uh, from which or which can be understandable f f how f to tell whether uh, uh, it is possible to analytically uh, solve the equation and, and get the frequency, not numerically, or is, is that um, just like there are some models that are known and they have question. no common... Um, and I guess just which ones are solvable analytically? Um, yeah, I mean, the, for the simple geometries, you know, it'll be it'll be possible to solve them often, but not always. I I know. Yeah, I 
I, I know that when it comes to nonlinear differential equations, I had a professor who used to always say, you know, there are 17 nonlinear differential equations. And if it's one of those, it's analytically solvable. And if it's not, then, well, we don't know. But no one's figured it out yet. So, um, so yeah, it's complicated. And I, you know, it, it, it would be nice if, it was, if there was an easy, easy answer. Um, sometimes you can approximate them also, though. Or maybe you could approximate two things and then interpolate between them if you wanted to kind of make a model that works. Anyway, it'd be really easy to build a modal model that interpolates between two different shapes. That would be kind of a fun thing to do, actually. Um, so this part is, might look a little bit like voodoo. But um, for people who, who, who knows Faust? Who's planning to learn Faust? Okay, <laughs> um, Faust, um, there's, there's a really nice feature in Faust that um, is based on the concept of term rewriting that's really convenient in terms of sometimes if you're writing something, you can sort of get it to automatically figure out, well, in this case, you know, I made it automatically generate the fast, the equivalent fast code for this, you know, rectangular membrane 410. The first time I made this, I just pasted a whole bunch of these after each other just to see that it worked and see what it sounded like. But to do that, you know, it's much nicer to just have it automatically do that. And you can do that with term rewriting, and, and I'm showing you how to do this here. And this is basically a recursion. So who's programmed a recursive program before? Um, so so you, you basically want to just write out a recursion so that it can sort of figure out how to do it. Um, and this is, this is what we did here. So you have to tell it how to terminate the recursion. So you have to some, so RMS triplet uh, basically tells you, here, let me look that up in the, this side. Um, so that RMS triplet generates basically a triplet of frequency, decay time, and equivalent mass to put into uh, the, the resonator's instantiation. But in order to get that, um, it's just more convenient to define it in terms of RMS triplet because then you only have to write it once. And the point being, and I did it again here, um, The point being, though, when you when you write out this recursion, you need to also have variables in it. So you have to come up with a new name. So I called it rectangular membrane simple recurse, which has four variables, which are sort of the current the current n and m, and then the maximum n and m, so it knows how high to go. And basically, you have to terminate the recursion so that it stops somewhere because you don't want the Faust compiler to generate an infinite number of lines of code, because then you're going to have a problem. And then, <laughs> and then you can kind of think of this as a grid, basically. And then you have to say, you know, if you want to, you've already defined, you know, what the one is back here in this corner, and you have to define all these other ones in terms of the previous ones. Um, and if you've done dynamic programming before, you'll be familiar with this sort of kind of thinking. But basically, when you get to uh, the end of one of these rows, you have to jump up to the end of the previous row. And then, if you're not at the end of a row, you just go over one by one. So it just sort of it enumerates them. Maybe that's a good way to put it. It enumerates them in this order um, so that you don't have to do it manually. And, um, and, and, and that takes care of it, basically. And so um, the only other parts that are in the model are the uh, define, definition of an H slider for volume and um, H sliders for the excitation position. And by the way, I wanted to add about volume. If you've ever implemented a volume in Faust, use DB2 linear. It's really handy. If you use DB2 linear, it, it lets you um, basically set the units for your sliders to be in decibels. 
And that gives you a better control over uh, the range of controlling a volume level. Um, it's, it's kind of like the difference between a linear potentiometer and an analog taper potentiometer. So you're going to want to use those if you're writing fast code for doing this. Um, and then some comb filters are applied to the output sound. This is just sort of icing on the cake, I guess. But um, some people would probably say it's not modal synthesis if you don't do this. So yeah, we add some comb filtering to so that you can strike the membrane in different positions and have the sound change. Um, so I guess what I should do is, is show the model at this point. So let me fire this up here. Let's see. I am going to show it on this computer instead, I think. Seems like the sound isn't on. Oh, why are those there? Okay, so there's the modal rectangular membrane. And um, if we zoom in, it's a little bit easier to see what's going on in here. So if, if you're playing a membrane and you increase the area mass density, then the pitch goes down. If you increase the length, then the pitch also goes down. If you, so I was saying that the Decay time was really important. So if you increase the decay time and you increase the cutoff frequency, then it just lasts a really long time. But if you shorten the decay time, then it's short, like this. But perhaps equally important, so as I was saying, we we're using this T60 to describe the sort of decay time at low frequencies, but the decay time at high frequencies is also, also important. Like that sounds kind of unnatural to me, or, or it sounds like some weird bell, you know, that you found somewhere, um, which might actually be kind of cool. But you can change the cutoff frequency that way and then it has a much darker tone it 
sounds more like a drum, maybe. But it depends on the dimensions, of course. This is maybe too oblong. This is too elongated to be sound like a drum. So if you make the X and Y length more similar, then it might sound more like a drum. But it, you know, it depends on exactly how similar they sound. And it would be interesting to do more psychoacoustic tests to learn, you know, what things actually sound like drums and what things don't. You know, what what parameter sets. Um, but if if we were to go change the the model um, complexity. Well, that kind of sounds like cutting off more and more modes, basically. But because we already have 40 modes, we already have a fairly rich sound, which is nice. So um, what else is there to say? Um, an interesting thing about SynthModeler, though, is once you have a simple model, you can start connecting more stuff to it. So this shows some masses on top of the resonator. So if you want to add some snares, to your rectangular membrane that you're, you're uh, simulating, you could do that. So there's an example model that does that also, which is modal rectangular membrane with snares. Oops, I did that too fast, I think. Oh, there's a new mode actually to SynthModeler now, which will let you um, automatically embed. If you're simulating a fire fader, it will let you automatically have sliders to represent the fire fader. But it's kind of annoying if your patch assumes you don't have that. On the other hand, if you're compiling your modules for Super Collider, um, it's really handy because then you don't have to. If you're someone like me and you don't know how to use Super Collider, you can get it to just already put them in there uh, the way you want, but um, here's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to reopen that, and then I'm going to touch this file so it thinks that I changed it. And then it'll recompile it. There, okay. Yes, and this is with Faust Gen, which is kind of a neat way to compile Faust code. This has the Faust compiler inside it, actually. Um, well, maybe I didn't sufficient. Anyway, so now it's down here, so I can do it from here, I think. Um, And actually, you can see the snares sort of bouncing on top of it right there. So that's kind of interesting. And it really, the sound changes a lot depending on how you set the mass parameters. So if you set the snare masses to be a lot smaller, then the, the sound will be different. Or if you make them bigger, then it'll change. Now they don't really sound like snares anymore. It's, it's interesting. It sounds kind of a little bit like reverb to me, kind of like a nonlinear reverb. Anyway, when, the more, when you start hooking more stuff together in SynthModeler, then you can get more sounds out of it. Um, and that's how you do it. All you have to do is add those masses. And then finally, um, an interesting way to think about making music um, is to have, um, you know, maybe have, have some of those have something happening in your physical simulation that's happening at a slower rate that automatically generates a score of music. Um, that's, a, that's a nice approach to take. Um, so thank you very much for your attention. One last question before lunch. Yes. Thank you. 
I've been programming a lot of fuzz programs uh, based on, well, basically uh, variations on a vocoder, and a lot of them have uh, oscillators that already have a formant. Mm -hmm. And I was hoping maybe one of these can be used as a oscillator with a formant. Maybe this uh, that brings would... some interesting sound possibilities, I think. That would be a very interesting example. I, I haven't made an example of that yet, but I hope someone will do that soon. All right. But yeah, a fun thing you can do with these models is put an audio signal into them and have it get convolved by the impulse response of the model. So that would be a neat, a neat approach for that. Yes, great. Um, thank you very much then.